religious. That's not part of science. The teachers are taught in their teacher's manuals, be sure to stress that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. Now, I happen to be a little old-fashioned. I think in science class we should be teaching science. Things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. Things like the first law of thermodynamics, which tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. Well, everything's made out of matter, so if matter cannot be created or destroyed, how did the world get here? We're here, you know. So that leaves only two choices. Somebody made the world, or the world made itself. <laughs> There's no other choice. Well, there are a few out there on the lunatic fringe who will tell you, we're not really here at all. We just think we're here. <laughs> okay, you can forget about those folks. We are here. So either somebody made the world like the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, or the world made itself like the humanists believe. Well, if the world just made itself, how did it get here? Well, the devil thought about that for a long time, and finally one day he came up with the Big Bang Theory. How many of you have ever heard of the Big Bang Theory before? I was on the airplane years ago, flying from Dallas to San Francisco, the land of the fruits and the flakes. And I happened to sit right next to a professor from Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley. I don't know if you folks here in Wisconsin have ever heard of Berkeley or not, but uh, Berkeley is not a Bible college. <laughs> so here I was on the airplane, sitting about that far away from this guy, and we started talking about creation and evolution. Everybody I sit by on the airplane wants to talk about that, so <laughs> I talk about it with him. <laughs> he, said, he said he believed in evolution. I said, yes, sir, I figured that. You have to to teach at Berkeley. I said, tell me, sir, if you believe in evolution, how did the world get here? He said, it came from the Big Bang. I said, really? I'd like to hear about this. He said, you're a science teacher and you've never heard of the Big Bang? I said, oh, yes, sir, I've heard a lot about the Big Bang, and I believe in the Big Bang. Uh, but my Big Bang is a whole lot different than yours. You tell me about your Big Bang, and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. <laughs> and so the professor started off on one of those answers that looked like it came straight from the textbook. He said, well, Mr. Hovind, I believe about 18 or 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe. Ooh, now that's a lot of stuff. And by the way, did you know the word universe comes from two Latin words? Uni means single, and verse is a spoken sentence. You know, we have verse and prose. Did you know we live in a universe, a single spoken sentence? God said, let there be. Now that'll preach, brother. There's a sermon in there someplace, okay? And if you can't find it, you ain't got no preach in you at all, all right? <laughs> all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. What? Everything in the universe squished into a dot smaller than a period on a page? Wow, that's one crowded dot. <laughs> and heavy, too. <laughs> Who held that thing up? By the way, this ain't the first time it happened, kids. This textbook says, someday all of the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, no bigger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then another big bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. <laughs> Did you know? They cut down a tree to print that. <laughs> Where's Al Gore when you need him? Mm, that's what I want to know, yeah. <laughs> now, this textbook author was brilliant. I could not believe how smart this guy was. He said, boys and girls, nothing really means nothing. <clears throat> you have to be at least that smart to write a book. He said, not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. What? Yes, boys and girls, you see, one day, nothing exploded. And here we are. <laughs> oh, that explains it. That sure does. We could spend hours talking about the Big Bang Theory. Get my college class, CSE 101, if you want to get into a whole lot more. We took our seminar and stretched it out to 60 hours and chased every rabbit and kicked every dog. And we had a whole lot more stuff on the college class, CSE 101, 102, 103, and 104. Here's Discover Magazine from April 2002. They said, boys and girls, where did everything come from? Yes, right here it says, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero. Nada. As it became bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory explains everything. Wow, I got to meet this Alan Guth guy. <laughs> Alan Guth said in Scientific American, he said, boys and girls, the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. 
In the Greek, that's a dot. He said, it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Wow. Yes, boys and girls, you see, we all came from a dot, and the dot came from nothing. They call that science and put it in a science book. I think I'd call that a fairy tale and put it in the garbage. I said, Professor, well, what happened to your dot? He said, well, Hoven, about 20 billion years ago, all the dirt in the universe was in this one little bitty tiny dot, and it was spinning real fast. This is what the textbooks teach. It spun faster and faster, and one day, boom, it exploded. And the pieces flew off, and they became galaxies, and sun, moon, stars, and finally, people, and were nothing but stardust. I said, sir, may I ask you a few questions, please? He said, sure, what would you like to know? I said, well, you told me 20 billion years ago, all the dirt got together for this big squish, and the big spin, and the big bang. Where'd all this dirt come from? Who made matter? He said, we don't know about that. I said, okay, sir, and I hold it. If I told you that I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created the heaven and the earth, then you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I don't know. But you said 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, and you don't know where the dirt came from. So basically, I believe in the beginning God, and you believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> don't tell me my theory is religious and yours is science. Oh, no, no, no. They're both religious. Both creation and evolution are religious, but the news media and the textbooks try to make it appear as if this is an argument between religion and science. I did a debate in El Paso, Texas, and they said, religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. This is called slanted journalism. It was two religions debating each other, not science and religion. Evolution is a religion, not a science. The both views, both creation and evolution, are inherently religious. The difference is, the evolution religion is tax-supported. And they couldn't survive without tax support. I've been saying for years, anybody that wants to believe in evolution should start a private school and teach those that want, who else wants to believe in evolution? It's got, it shouldn't be funded by public tax dollars. I mean, come on, it's a religion. Nothing but a religion. And by the way, these two timelines are the same information right here. I'll be referring to this throughout the seminar. The Bible teaches that about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood that destroyed everything. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. That's what starts our calendar. And here we are today, year 2003. On this chart, every inch is 150 years. If I was to make the 20 billion year chart at the same scale as this one, this chart should actually be 2,100 miles long to match this scale. That would be from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon. I don't want to carry a chart that big, so I made a new scale for the other one, okay? <laughs> anyway, the professor said he did not know where the matter came from. I said, well, sir, could you tell me where the laws came from? You know, who made gravity? Who made the law of gravity? Centrifugal force, inertia, who's the law giver? He said, we don't know about that. I said, well, sir, can you tell me where the energy came from? You know, it takes energy to make something move. Who bought the gas to run this machine anyway? He said, we don't know about that either. I said, sir, may I ask you another question, please? He said, uh, sure. What else would you like to know? <laughs> else? What do you mean, else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, sir, does Berkeley have a merry-go-round? How many of you know what a merry-go-round is? You go round, round, round to your puke. You've been on them before. He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round at Berkeley. I said, you ought to get one, man. You could learn some good science on a merry-go-round. If you put some fourth graders on a merry-go-round, are there any fourth graders in here this morning? Any oh, man, all right. I like fourth graders. I spent the best five years of my life in the fourth grade. <laughs> that was before they diagnosed ADD. <clears throat> We're going to put some fourth graders on the merry-go-round and get the high school football team out there to get it spinning clockwise as fast as it will possibly go. Now, if you have a digital watch, you may not know what clockwise means. <laughs> Never mind. I'll explain it later. We're going to spin the merry-go-round clockwise. The kids are going to go through four phases. They start off in phase one. They're screaming at the football players. Come on, let's go faster, faster. Can't you go any faster? You get up around 30 miles an hour. The kids enter phase two, where they stop screaming. They just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on for dear life. <laughs> you get up around 60 miles an hour. The kids enter phase three, where they start screaming again. <laughs> but now they're screaming, stop, stop, please slow down. Don't stop, though. Keep going faster and faster. When you get to about 100 miles an hour, the kids enter phase four. That's where they begin to fly off the merry-go-round. 
Now, if you watch this carefully, if the kids fly off the merry-go-round, and the merry-go-round is going clockwise, when the kid flies off, the kid will be spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance, like a tree or telephone pole. That's because of a law in physics known as the conservation of angular momentum. You see, if a spinning object breaks apart in a frictionless environment, which is what the Big Bang would have been, all the matter in one spot, no friction, the pieces that fly off are going to spin the same direction as the original object because the outside is moving faster than the inside. And we could talk all day about the Big Bang Theory and the conservation of all sorts of problems within our own solar system for the conservation of angular momentum. But the professor said, yes, I understand about the conservation of angular momentum. I said, well, good. Then would you answer me just one question? If the universe began as a swirling dot, shh, shouldn't everything be spinning the same way? He said, yes. I said, well, did you know that uh, two, maybe three, of the planets are spinning backwards? Did you know that eight of the 91 known moons are spinning backwards? Sir, did you know some of the whole galaxies are spinning backwards? Why? He said, that's interesting. <laughs> I said, no, sir, that's more than interesting. That's kind of hard on your Big Bang Theory. He said, why do you think they're going backwards? I was hoping he was going to ask that. I said, sir, it's very simple. You see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God did it that way on purpose, just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. <laughs> and it is stupid, okay? We cover lots more on that in our college class, CSE 101. I do believe in the Big Bang, though, because the Bible teaches the Big Bang. It says, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. In the original Greek, that's a Big Bang. So there's going to be a Big Bang. It just didn't happen yet. So kids, if you go to school and some professor says, do you believe in the Big Bang? You should say, yes, I do, and you better get saved and get ready for it. The Big Bang is coming soon to a city near you. <laughs> Big Bang Theory is a dud. They've known about it for a long time. We could talk for hours on the Big Bang Theory. It is simply ridiculous. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher. It's 900 pages, and it's five bucks. You can get it from our ministry and give those out to anybody you know that wants to learn a whole lot more about creation.